All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's broadcast, which is our first broadcast of the second semester. So we're going to be picking up with, uh, you know, what comes after Napoleon. OK, now, as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions for me tonight, go ahead and submit those questions. Remember, ask a question. We've only got five people in here. This may end up being a shorter session, you know, depending on how much interest we have. Um, and I'm going to go into a little bit of discussion on the Congress of Vienna. I usually like to start off with some questions if anybody has them. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and send them my way. Now, as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, I can go ahead and if nobody's got questions right away, I can go ahead and get into the Congress of Vienna. Now, we will continue to have these sessions on Wednesday nights at nine o'clock. Now, just excuse me if you hear something funny about my voice. It's because I have a cold. Now, of course, uh, you know, I'm taking my own advice and staying hydrated. Yeah, so y'all make sure drink plenty of water, get plenty of sleep, don't get sick like me. Okay, so as far as the Congress of Vienna, um, let's go ahead and sometimes, you know, if you're kind of curious, um, what is it that I need to know for the exam? You go into uh, AP Euro course description. Okay. So as far as that goes, now the Congress of Vienna actually shows up multiple times in here. So it tells you something um, that it's something that we could that we could see. OK, um, so as far as that goes, Congress of Vienna and Nether, uh, Metternich, the balance of, a balance of power emerged, developed and eventually became institutionalized over time. OK, and this is part of uh, key concept. Let's see, 2.1. After the defeat of Napoleon by a coalition of European powers, the Congress of Vienna attempted to restore the balance of power in Europe and contain the danger of revolutionary or nationalistic upheavals in the future. Okay, so that's where that's what we're looking at here um, in terms of that. And let me see where else that might come up. All right. And what part of the document is this? OK, so that's a little bit different. But the main thing here, we see the purpose of the Congress of Vienna. OK, and we're trying to restore the balance of power. Now, um, if you're writing. If you're writing a an LEQ, OK, I'm going to think about, you know, doing this as an LEQ um, kind of thing here. Now, evaluate the extent. OK, now let me go ahead and make this just a little bit bigger so you've got that <coughs> and i might clean up this language just a little bit but i think we're you read the extent to which the agreements reached at the congress of vienna okay in 1815 um differ differed from the agreements reached at the paris peace conference in 1919 okay now uh the thing is uh if we're going to write an leq looking at something like this okay if we're comparing <coughs> one thing i do here and of course i go into that in my ap euro leq video as well and then of course i've got my eight month writing clinic if you go to tomrich.net you're interested in that if not you know you still get some help here uh, I'm going to do some some writing things here and there in these fiveable sessions. OK, so as far as that goes, the way that I set up these uh, these boxes, OK, I call these my boxes um, for the DBQ. I always set up a T chart uh, for an LEQ. I like my boxes. And so one thing we've got here is the Congress of Vienna and then the Paris Peace Conference. Now, in this box, I'm going to look at what is unique to the Congress of Vienna. Here, what are some unique things about the Paris Peace Conference? And then what is common to both? Now, by this time, right now, y'all are y'all are probably, a lot of your classes um, are either on the Congress of Vienna, you've recently done it, or you're going to get to it soon. And so when we think about that, the Congress of Vienna, We've got uh, this is after the Napoleonic Wars. OK, so, uh, you know, a peace settlement. After the Napoleonic 
force. Okay. Uh, then we could say here uh, that you have your dominant person in the Congress of Vienna is Clemens von Metternich, or I'm just going to put here since we're just making notes. Metternich. Now, the purpose here, okay, now this was a, you know, basically a conservative piece, okay, and the aim was to restore the balance of power in Europe, okay? So the thing is that France has become too powerful. We need to, uh, you know, we need to make sure, kind of put them back the way they were before the French Revolution. That is the objective here, okay? When we look at, uh, at what's going on in the Congress of Vienna. Now, I'm just going to make just a little bit of a... Um, Thing here just to make it a little neater. Okay, so peace settlement after the Napoleonic Wars, Metternich, conservative peace, restore the balance of power, uh, you know, restored. So basically, France, okay, France uh, <coughs> has the 1791 borders, okay. Um, so basically, France restored to 1791 borders. Now, what they're trying to do there is deprive the French of conquest, okay? That is the whole objective there, that they're depriving the French of conquest. Now, here we're looking at what is unique to the Paris Peace Conference. Now, the question will probably say something like what you saw there, where Paris Peace Conference 1919. Notice that the way that this question was worded, it said nothing about the Napoleonic Wars, and it said nothing about uh, about World War One in particular. OK, so nothing about the Napoleonic Wars, nothing about World War One. So a peace settlement after World War One. OK, we've got as far as people, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the United States. You could even go into Lloyd George. OK, so UK and. Lamonso. Oh, from France. Okay. Now, um, you know, you may not know all of those people and that's fine if you don't. I don't like how I did the spacing here. Sorry. I'm just going to have to do this uh, real quick there. I can keep, I can be kind of a stickler here for the, okay. Yes. That's what I should have done there. All right. So that's what I should have done. And then we'll get that. This will be a little bit less messy in just a second. Kind of making a template here. So I'll be able to do this in future sessions without a hitch. All right. So basically the purpose of restoring France, their 1791 borders was deprive, deprived of war conquest. Okay. Um, so essentially that's what you're looking at, uh, what you're looking at there. Now, so as far as what happened at the at the Paris Peace Conference, okay. <clears throat> so you've got Woodrow Wilson. Now the other thing is that you have a liberal peace, okay. So well, I don't know if I'd call it a liberal peace, but it's not so much a uh, you know so influenced influenced by liberalism and nationalism, okay. So definitely instead of being influenced. Um, instead of being influenced by conservatism, influenced by liberalism and nationalism. Now, instead of restoring the balance of power, um, what you've got here really is to punish Germany, okay, for starting World War One. okay, for starting World War One. I'm putting that in quotes because really when we think about who started World War, World War One, that's a little bit of a uh, thing there. Now, Germany is not going to be restored to its pre-war borders. Basically, uh, you know, Germany and Austria, you know, so land taken from Germany and Austria. Uh, you know, so basically you've got, uh, you know, and the self-determination of peoples, all of that kind of stuff. You know, you go into the 14 points article. 231, uh, which is the war guilt clause, that sort of thing. Now, this is the kind of thing that I would start off with um, in this kind of uh, thing. Now, notice that I'm setting up my essay. I'm already, you know, noting some things that I'm going to say. Here are my pieces of evidence, the arguments, all of that. Now, common to both, okay? So as far as that, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, both were, <laughs> of course, I'm going to focus more, I think, on the differences, but both of these conferences, both were, uh, you know, agreements, 
reached after devastating continental wars. Okay, so both were agreements reached after devastating continental wars. And so as far as that goes, I can't really, you know, right off the top of my head, not so sure that there is a lot of, um, you know, a lot of room to say, okay, well, there's a similarity there and all of uh, all of that kind of stuff. But maybe something will come to me. Got to warn y'all, I've got a little bit of cold medication there. But now the thing is, the volume doesn't really matter because when you're doing like compare and contrast, uh, there doesn't have to be a balance. So if you're like, hey, I've got more that I've got, you know, I've got more contrasting than I've got comparison. That is totally okay. There is absolutely nothing wrong uh, with that, uh, you know, with that arrangement. Okay. So that's something that, you know, no problem there. Um, so, you know, both re agreements reached after devastating continental wars. Also, we could go into, you know, that basically there is an effort <coughs> um, to create governments. Okay. So an effort, effort to create governments along the lines of the government's of the victors okay because the thing is that even though there's a difference there the congress of vienna is more like aristocratic uh that is something that uh, you know, they are trying to create aristocratic monarchies uh, so that Europe won't go all Republican. Whereas in the Paris Peace Conference, you think about like the self-determination of peoples and all of that kind of stuff. And then they're trying to create liberal democracies. OK, so basically um, aristocratic monarchies in 1815 and <coughs> uh, liberal democracies in 1919. And of course, the defeated parties, it's like Germany was not a, a liberal democracy at that time. So just a little something there. Now, of course, I've got a lot of stuff on my YouTube channel about the Congress of Vienna, including a uh, recent meditation video that I created that I hope uh, that I hope y'all enjoy. If you haven't seen that video, it's one of my most recent videos. Go ahead and take a look at that. I think that, that is a uh, you know that that could be a fun time for you. All right. So as far as that goes, a little bit there about the Congress of Vienna, and I'm going to see if we've got any questions being asked. Um, but this is how you would set this uh, set this up. Now, uh, okay, we've got a question. Excellent. I'm so happy to see a question. All right. And so going in here. All right. So, Alan, can I explain how the territories were divided during the Congress of Vienna? OK, so we can go into a, um, you know, a map of Europe. 18, 15. Now, it's going to be a little bit more, you know, there's a lot more to it. Uh, when you get into, uh, you know, the Paris Peace Conference and all of that kind of stuff. Now, let's see. Am I? Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. So I'm going to go. I'm going to share my screen with you. That would happen during the A push session. I thought I was sharing my screen and I actually wasn't. OK, um, so as far as that goes, um, let's go ahead and take a look at the map of Europe in 1815. And again, if anybody's coming late, excuse my voice. I've got got a cold. If I'm a little off on some things, it's the cold. I'm going to blame the cold medication. OK. Uh, and just not feeling that well. Now, notice that France, okay, so there is now the Kingdom of France. Uh, it's back to not the French Republic, not the French Empire, um, but the Kingdom of France. Now, um, the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved by Napoleon. And so the thing is that is replaced by the German Confederation. All right. So the Holy Roman Empire had about 300 or so sovereign states and semi-sovereign states and principalities. And so what we see here is only about 38, 39, you know, just slightly less than 40. Right. And so you can see here that uh, you've got Prussia. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, Prussia keeps the borders that it had before. Um, you've got here the Empire of Austria. Now, notice here as well, you've got this uh, kingdom of the Netherlands. So the Netherlands goes from a, you know, a federal republic, like a federal, yeah, federal republic um, to being a kingdom. So again, with that, it's trying to create these 
monarchies. And so, you know, you notice Austria still has all of its land. Uh, Russia still has all of its land. Looks like they've decided um, to create another kingdom of Poland. I was not exactly aware of that. I'll have to look at that and just make sure that, uh, yeah, that's that's something kind of new um, that's new on me. But notice that essentially what's what they're trying to do is to, you know, just put things back the way the way they were. So France has the same borders that it had. No land was taken away from France that was taken, you know, that France did not have earlier. OK, so that it's not too complicated. Most of what's happening there, though, is the establishment of a kingdom in the Netherlands and then also, you know, what you see in Germany, which is going to kind of foreshadow German unification, because now instead of having 300 or so states, then you've got uh you know, only about 38, 39. Now, remember, ladies and gentlemen, y'all can ask me questions that are not uh, directly related to the Congress of Vienna. The Congress of Vienna is just kind of my stated topic tonight in the emphasis area. And when questions come in about the Congress of Vienna, I'm going to give those precedents over other questions. But right now I'm in a situation where I don't have any questions. I've done a little workup of the Congress of Vienna. I'm going to sit here for just a little bit. Now, we've only got about six in there. I think that people are back at school. Okay. You're looking at your notes, Alan. That's fine. That's fine. Go ahead and get some questions in here. Um, because some of y'all are just starting back at school this week. Some people are probably better to be back at school. Some people are probably a little under the weather like I am. And, you know, so we've got a, got a small group and that's fine. Typically these things last an hour, but if y'all aren't demanding an hour, then, you know, we can, we can definitely have a little shorter session and call it a night. So let's go ahead and, um, and see, yeah, if y'all have got questions go ahead and uh, go ahead and send them my way i would like to answer them all right alan's looking at his notes all right alan get me get me one question one question and then look back at your notes maybe and then we've got five other people so let's go ahead and get those questions out there all right first thing on your mind ladies and gentlemen let's get it to me let's get it to me all right alan clock's ticking on you buddy all right oh there we go i've got a question okay excellent excellent all right what exactly is okay now what you're asking is not so much the congress system but technically the technical term for that is the concert system uh you know i would definitely say uh take a look i've got a lot of resources on youtube on the congress of vienna i've got the lecture i've got a rap i've got a metternich rap that uh, goes into some of this as well now the concert system now of course you know we think concerts today uh you know my my daughter was very very excited about imagine dragons uh, uh, you know, playing at the Super Bowl uh, or not the what am I thinking? The college football playoff. Okay. The co which is basically the Super Bowl for those of us who live in the South, right? So uh, imagine Dragons played the call the halftime show at the college football playoff. And my daughter was like, you know, my wife said, I'm going to put you to bed at halftime. My daughter said, no, it has to be after halftime. She's eight. So she's starting to develop these preferences. Like imagine dragons is playing. Imagine dragons has like all these, like, you know, smoke and lights and sounds and the crowd's like, all, oh, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, I, I you know, I, I like to, I like to go to a metal show every once in a while, you know, so, you know, y'all, you know, when we think about concerts, we think something pretty crazy, but at this time, a concert, this, is everyone, you know, what concert means, you know, everyone working in concert. So the violinists and uh, the, you know, the timpani and the French horn and all of this other stuff, you know, so it's like everybody is playing their part and Metternich is kind of like the conductor during this time. Okay. So he's there, you know, making sure it's like all the individuals are doing their part and then, you know, everyone's working together. Now the conservative order that's established by Metternich, what you're, what you're looking at is, um, you know, the, the idea of stability. All right. Conservatism, the really what attracts people to conservatism and it's why conservatives like in Western societies, it's like any time there is 
uh, you know, a progressive like movement, a lot of things changing, a lot of legislation being passed and all of that kind of stuff. You know, people are going to go fall back on something more conservative. Conservatism offers stability. Now, with Metternich, there are two types of stability that Metternich wanted to achieve through the concert system. Uh, the whole the whole bedrock of this is that if everyone had worked together very early on, then the French Revolution could have been prevented. OK, so if, if Europe, if the great powers of Europe hadn't just sat there and like watched that train wreck and just looked at it until it was ready to, you know, ready to blow up like a powder keg, they could have nipped it in the bud very early. So stability within states. OK, so first of all, no revolutions. OK, that the great powers of Europe are going to work together in concert. OK, so everybody's playing their instruments, working together in concert, stability within states. So if there's a revolution in one country, other countries are going to help to intervene. Uh, if any of you've had U.S. history. It's almost like if you think about the Constitution was an answer to Shays' rebellion that Massachusetts, why should Massachusetts have to work by itself to put down this rebellion? Why can't other states uh, be of assistance in the federal government? So as far as that goes, stability within states, no revolutions. Then stability between states that you don't have wars. And besides the Crimean War, OK, now the Crimean War, the Franco-Prussian War, there are, you know, some wars, but those wars are limited and they're between only maybe two or three parties. OK, so, you know, as far as that goes, you don't have another war on the scale of the Napoleonic Wars um, until uh, you know, until World War One, it's almost 100 years. Now, are there some tremors here and there? Sure. But especially in this period between 1815 and 1848, which we refer to as the age of Metternich, uh, during this time, it is, um, you know, during this time, what we're looking at um, is pretty much besides Greek independence and the French Revolution of 1830, which basically traded one monarchy for another, then that's that's essentially uh, that's that's essentially it. OK, so you don't really have between 1815, and 1848, another major war. Now, that is, of course, unlike after the Paris Peace Conference, that you have a another war very, very quickly. OK, so the Congress of Vienna, you know, had, you know, had some results. Now, at the same time, there's also a degree of repression because, you know, they are. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that again. Just a bit under the weather. I'm doing what I can. Uh, but, you know, of course, there is some repression associated with that, that you've got the uh, the Burschenschaften, uh, the student societies in the German states that are trying to promote liberal and nationalist ideals. And, of course, Metternich and his uh, conservatives don't really have uh, a whole lot of tolerance for that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to at least reach the 30. I think it'd be cool to at least reach the 30 minute mark before this, uh, before this, uh, we call it a night. Now, of course, you know, part of me is like, yeah, I could really just use some sleep right now. But let's go ahead and get a couple more questions in there. All right. Alan, you still looking at those notes? All right. Come on, y'all. Come on. Y'all uh, come on with your questions. It's OK. It's OK. I, I promise. <laughs> All right. And Karen, teachers can ask questions, too. So we're, uh, you know, if you want to ask a question, I mean, that's I'm always glad to take questions from teachers uh, as well. So go ahead. If anybody's got a question, y'all go ahead and get those into me. Get those in. All right. Let's see. Maybe y'all are just having compassion for me and like, OK, you can go to bed, Tom Ritchie. All right. Um. So, ladies and gentlemen, now, as far as that goes, now, another thing is I'm talking about the, uh, you know, about the peace um, after the Congress of Vienna. Remember that uh, the, you know, the Paris Peace Conference, you're laying the foundation for another war, essentially. Um, so that's uh, that's definitely something that uh, that needs to be taken into consideration as well, uh, is that the Congress of Vienna, even though 
you know, there was some repression. You're not really seeing the uh, the development of, you know, democracy the same way you're going to see it in the United States during this period. But at the same time, uh, this European continent that Jefferson had referred to, uh, you know, Jefferson in his second inaugural address, I believe it was the second, he said that we had, you know, God had blessed us to separate us from the exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe, like Europe, he described as an exterminating havoc. Of course, that was at the time of the French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, and, you know, Europe was just at war all the time. But after the Congress of Vienna, we see a little bit of a break from that. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are just kind of revving up for the second semester. And yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I would definitely that would be that that would be my assessment of this, that the Congress of Vienna, you know, given that its goal was to lay a foundation for uh, a balance of power in Europe. And I think a lot of it is just, you know, what did they what did they go in with? So, you know, they they accomplished their goal of, you know, France. We want to we want to make sure that France is in the position to be as dominant as they were. But there is an acknowledgement that France needs to be strong, that basically Europe deprived of a strong France would be imbalanced. And so, you know, in order for the balance of power to work, Britain, France, Prussia, Austria and Russia all have to be strong. And so with that, you know, they they made it to where, OK, that's that's going to last a while. Now, then when you go to, uh, you know, the Paris Peace Conference, it's like Germany, you know, Germany's a problem. We got to, um, you know, we've got to make sure that Germany does not have the capability to make another war uh, and that Germany is going to be economically crippled. So, yes, I think that the Paris Peace Conference, I mean, it falls apart um, very, very quickly. Uh, in terms of that, and especially, you know, given that, you know, you see these, you know, the Great Depression, I mean, the rise of these totalitarian regimes uh, that, you know, is happening very, very soon afterwards, whereas you, you know, you don't see that. Of course, the thing is that the Congress of Vienna, you know, created these aristocratic monarchies, which held for a while. Uh, whereas the you know Paris Peace Conference created these very fragile liberal democracies that you know just uh, just basically shattered uh, with uh, you know with just a little bit of uh, with just a little bit of strain. <coughs> Excuse me, everyone. Good news is you can't catch my cold over the internet. All right. Okay. Now I don't know as far as. Uh, yeah, I mean, ask ask whatever questions you've got. Ask what questions you've got. Now, middle class liberals appease so that they did not revolt. Now, the thing is, <laughs> the Hungarian revolt was part of the revolutions of 1848. So that's that's the the thing is that essentially um, it just wasn't tolerated. Now, remember that besides Britain. OK, that before the French Revolution, Britain was really the only to the extent that Britain's even European. Right. Britain was the only society that really had liberalism, as we as we say it, like, you know, basically um, in the mid eight, you know, after the Glorious Revolution, I mean, throughout the 18th century, <coughs> somebody in Britain could be whatever religion they want. Uh, you know, there were some restrictions, you know, you can't be an atheist, but at the very, at the very least, um, you know, Christian toleration, uh, you know, it was it was something that, you know, people were able to, you know, express, uh, you know, profess a lot of different faiths. Whereas when you look on the continent of Europe, it was very rare that you have the kind of open religious toleration that you had there. Of course, uh, you know, Britain after 1689 had a. Um, you know, a very entrenched par parliament. <coughs> All right. So you had, you know, a representative body there that was, you know, that had official standing. And so one thing to remember is, you know, you've got the growing middle class in Europe, but in Austria and in Germany, um, Hungary and all these places, they're not used to being able to like print whatever newspapers they want and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, this is really these are novel ideas, but, you know, you get, uh, you know, you've got some repressive measures taken as well, such as, you know, Metternich and the Carlsbad decrees and the Burschen Schaften and all of that kind of stuff. Now, when I say repression, I'm not talking about like 
totalitarian repression of like Hitler, Stalin and people like that. But certainly there was a part on the government, you know, I mean, it's liberalism that says you've got to let people like put other viewpoints out there. Okay. That in a liberal society, somebody can say something that's dangerous to the government. Now I can't, uh, as an American, I can't overthrow the, you know, try to overthrow the government. That would be treasonous, but I can express my discontent with the government. I can advocate for other people to lead, lead the government and that sort of thing. Conservatism, classical conservatism, you don't have to have any of that kind of stuff because that kind of stuff is viewed as dangerous, whereas liberals believe in the marketplace of ideas. So in that uh, in that sense, uh, you know, now the revolutions of 1848, some of this is going to simmer. And then once it starts to, you know, it all, you know, the pot starts to like boil over a little bit and then everything breaks out. Of course, after a few years, it's all, uh, you know, it's all brought back to, you know, it's all brought back to normal. All right. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now, Alan, I'd also direct you. I've got a five part lecture on the revolutions of 1848 that should probably answer <coughs> any question you have about that. And ladies and gentlemen, I guess it's good that we had a low attendance day when I'm not feeling that well. But, uh, I, you know, I apologize that uh, I'm coughing and just, you know, that sort of thing, but just not something I can help at the moment, but I'm just glad that I'm not right in front of you. So I can't get you sick. Um, just go to YouTube and type in revolutions of 1848 and you'll see that series. The first part of my video series on the revolutions of 1848 does the big picture. Like this is what the revolution of 1848 is about. And then I've got three segments that look at Italy, the France, the German States and Italy. And then uh, finally, the last part of it is why not Britain? Why not Russia? OK, whereas with Britain, it's because there were already these institutions that were there for, you know, that could address public discontent. The parliament was, was responsive, whereas in Russia, again, I mentioned repression, you know, Russia. Anytime there was dissent, Russia is still operating on, you know, a full on autocracy. And so it's like, how do you appease people? Sometimes you appease people by, you know, it's kind of like Napoleon said when, uh, you know, he crushed that royalist revolt during the directory. It's like he gave him a whiff of grape shot. Um, that'll appease someone just as well as uh, so doing something to make them happy. So as far as that goes, that's, uh, you know, something that would be worthwhile to look at. So definitely uh, join me next week. And again, I should be uh, fully recovered by then and we'll have a, uh, we'll have a much better time. And thank y'all for showing up and I'll see y'all again in a week. It's uh, what's next week's topic. I believe next week's topic. Uh, let me, let me just take a quick uh, look at my, at my calendar, the declared topic for next week is 19th century isms okay so the main yeah so our our questions uh, of course the priority questions now remember y'all are always welcome to ask whatever questions y'all have um but the uh the priority topic will be the 19th century isms all right ladies and gentlemen it is always a pleasure <laughs>